Hello, this is Tanner Dykin, pastor of Open Door Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. Uh, this video is on the coherence-based genealogical method of text criticism. Uh, over a year ago, I created a video on the method which was well received. Uh, however, because there were several rough places in that video, uh, I'm remaking it here to hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, help people uh, understand it uh, more thoroughly. I'd like to begin by thanking Tommy Wasserman and Peter Gurry for the work they've done in making the method intelligible to the English-speaking audience, and I'd also like to thank uh, Taylor DeSoto, who's an associate pastor at Agros Reform Baptist Church uh, in Gilbert, Arizona, uh, for helping me in the production of this video. Now to start, let's note a few peculiarities in the CBGM. The CBGM primarily deals with the texts which manuscripts bear witness to, rather than the manuscripts themselves. Considerations of the manuscripts are not entirely irrelevant to the work of the CBGM, but they are not its primary subjects. We're trying to find out what the development of the various texts looked like over time, and what their relationships to each other are. The CBGM is essentially Lachman's idea of the genealogy of manuscripts applied only to the texts of those manuscripts. But instead of determining this genealogy by simply looking at a few uh, common errors, a large number of genealogically significant variant units are evaluated to determine a witness's pedigree. Manuscripts are only seen as evidence that a certain form of the text it, with all its variants, was once in circulation. For this reason, the use of the term witness is preferred when speaking about a text that is found in the historical record. You'll also notice as we move through how the system works that the discussion around the texts of manuscripts has shifted from talking about text types to looking at how individual variant units can inform us about the evolution of those texts. And so with that, let's move on to uh, discuss the uh, problem which the CBGM purports to uh, solve, and that is the problem of contamination. As we look at the text of a witness, we often discover that it is not simply a copy from one ancestor text we find that sometimes what happened was that a scribe would be copying from a primary manuscript, but for whatever reason, he would switch to copying secondary manuscripts. Perhaps because his primary manuscript was missing a section, and he was supplying it from his secondary manuscript. Or he may have been cognizant of variant readings at a place he was copying, and so he selected a reading which was not in his primary source manuscript. This results in a text that is difficult to place in a genealogy by hand because it is uncertain where the contaminated sections came from. And so computers have been implemented to aid the human text critic in detecting contamination and keeping track of how the text evolved from one generation to another. And so with that in mind, let's look at the first step in the method. And that is the concept of pre-genealogical coherence. This is the frequency of agreement on known places of variation between the texts of two witnesses. We have here an example contrived from the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. We have six places where variants have been found in various witnesses. The two witnesses we have agree on four of the six. So the pre-genealogical coherence is roughly 66%. Please note that the numbers and figures represented in all the examples we'll be looking at are highly exaggerated to help with comprehension of the ideas involved. With pre-genealogical coherence, all we're doing is counting up the places where various texts have been known to differ from each other, and finding the percentage of those places which our two texts agree on. By using this information, we can determine whether two witnesses are closely related to each other or not, though we cannot yet tell which comes prior to the other. 
That is what we'll begin to see in the next concept. The concept of local stemma. The word stemma, the plural being stemata, is derived from the Latin word, which is derived from the Greek, meaning a wreath. And the question asked by the various types of stemata in the CBGM is, what item is primary and which is secondary? In other words, which item stems from the other? Local stemma is the choice of the text critic as to the direction of the change of a variant from one reading to another. At each place of known variation, the critic will decide which variant is most likely original, which ones are derivative, and what the progression of those readings looked like as the text evolved. So you see how each of these variants have arrows pointing in the direction of change. That's what the local stemma is. It is adding the element of direction to each variant unit. We'll go through and we'll find all of the different variant readings that are found in the history of a text. And at each place, individual place of variation, that's why it's called the local stemma, because it's at a particular place of variation. At each particular place, we'll try to find out what the original reading likely was and uh, the progression uh, of readings that came after the original. And so, for instance, uh, if we look at number four here, uh, it goes from allegory to alligator to alligator pit. Uh, and a, a plausible progression for this is that the original reading was allegory, uh, but a scribe was uh, sleepy uh, and uh, he uh, was uh, falling asleep and he began to dream about an alligator uh, as he was copying the, the, the text. And so he uh, woke up and continued to copy and uh, alligator was introduced into the text. Uh, in the next generation of copies, a, uh, a scribe saw the error alligator and he simply inserted the word pit at the end. Uh, maybe he wanted to make it funnier and, and so he inserted that word. Uh, but the point uh, here is that uh, the text critic will, will, will try to determine which was the uh, original reading and what the pro progression of readings that, that flow out of that is. And so they'll give it this uh, sense of directionality, but it is a choice which the text critic makes. These choices will initially be made based on the same kind of reasoning as traditional text criticism. For more information on traditional text criticism, see the presentation linked in the footnote and in this video's description. The next idea in the CBGM is the concept of genealogical coherence. We've seen pre-genealogical coherence. Now we're looking at genealogical coherence. This is the frequency of the directions of local stomata at places of disagreement between two witnesses. We are now looking at all those places in our two texts not covered by pregenealogical coherence. Much like pregenealogical coherence, we are simply counting the percentage of disagreements and sorting them according to which direction of change they have. Then we count up how many variants go in one direction and how many go in the other. When we're finished, we'll have three percentage values. One for pre-genealogical coherence, that is the agreement between the two witnesses. One for variance where A is primary and B is derivative. And one where B is primary and A is derivative. This tells us which text is likely an ancestor text to the other. Since more variants in B are primary than in A, 
B is potentially an ancestor to A in this example. The next uh, idea uh, requires a little bit of setting up, the idea of sub -sub substema. And to understand the concept of substema, we must first talk about some parsimonious assumptions that go into this work. They are derived from the principle of parsimony, a concept taken from evolutionary theory in biology, which is aimed at simplifying models. It's kind of like Occam's razor applied to scientific theories, scientific models. At the moment, there are four assumptions being used. One, scribes mostly made good copies. Two, most variants found in a text are derived from an ancestor text rather than from immediate scribal error. Three, scribes made few, uh, used few source copies. Four, ancestors will have a high pre-genealogical coherence with their descendants. All of these assumptions are for the purpose of simplifying the genealogical model, which will be produced by the CBGM. So with that, we can now come to uh, what substema actually is. Substema is a list of the fewest close potential ancestors necessary to fully explain the existence of a text and their relationships to that text. In order to explain every reading found in Witness A, the computer will search for the fewest number of witnesses which have a high pre-genealogical coherence with A and which explain every reading found in A. The computer will produce many of these models, and a human text critic will then sift through them to find the simplest model that is consistent with the data. In this example, A is produced by a scribe which had three source texts at his disposal. They account for every reading found in A, but three source texts is a little much. Let's see if we can find a better model. Here, this is better. Uh, in this example, the same witness is explained by the use of only two source texts. This explanation is therefore preferable under the method because of its simplicity. And this brings us to the final idea in the CBGM, and that's the concept of the global stemma. The global stemma is the full account of the genealogical history of the text, or at least as much as can be reconstructed feasibly. The process of creating substema will continue until every text witness has been given an adequate explanation of its existence on the basis of ancestor texts. All of these substemata will then be attached together to form a branching tree of hypothetical relationships between themselves. The image I have on the slide is taken from B.B. Warfield's Introduction to the Textual Criticism of the New Testament, published in 1886. This is the old Lachmanian idea of genealogies, but only applied to the development of the text rather than the manuscripts themselves. There are several proposed benefits to using this method. At every step in the process up to this point, tensions in the model can be identified and adjustments can be made to alleviate those tensions. Assumptions about the initial text can also be challenged when they are found to strain the plausibility of the model. And so this is the CBGM in a nutshell. And so with that, let's move on to uh, some evaluation of the model, of the, the method. And I'd first like to note a point of usefulness in the method. Pre-genealogical coherence has objective utility when dealing with the text of intact witnesses. It cannot be influenced by a text critic's bias. When applied properly, it can only be applied in one way. It has already demonstrated also the care taken by scribes in copying the Byzantine text. In fact, 
all other text types have been dropped from most text critics' vocabulary for the time being because of the comparatively low coherence of any other grouping of texts. As an advocate for the received text of the church, this is useful to note. Now on to some points of criticism. And uh, the first that I'd like us to see here is that the problem of contamination remains without a full solution. There are scenarios where contamination remains undetectable to the CBGM toolset. Such scenarios result in an inversion of the proper genealogical relationships between an ancestor text and its descendants. For more information on these scenarios, you may consult the two references at the bottom of the screen and in the video description. For now, though, one example will suffice. In the scenario on the left, text A produces text B, which introduces a large number of variants, and together A and B produce one. Two generations of copies are made from the line of one, and each generation receives an increasing amount of influence from B. When the data from these texts is evaluated by the method, it will be seen as a straight line of descent from A and terminating in B. See the figure on the right. The substema for B has been inverted in this scenario. Another point of criticism is that everything from local, the, the local stemma onward is dependent on the opinion of the text critics or the tendencies of the principles they're using. If the assumptions utilized in choosing the initial readings are generally incorrect, then the model produced by the method will not accurately reflect the history of the text. For instance, that the shorter reading is to be preferred and that the more difficult reading is to be preferred, may, descri uh, may describe the inverse of what actually happened to the text. This can lead to large-scale inversions in the substema and global stemma of the text. Three, uh, th our third uh, uh, point of criticism, is that the principle of parsimony may not accurately reflect the history of the text. These assumptions, while reasonable, are directed towards simplifying our models and not necessarily toward truth. History is messy, and while it's nice to have an intelligible model, we have no way of verifying these assumptions. And finally, uh, the final criticism that we have here is that the small amount of information available to us about the earliest form of the New Testament text limits how much can be reconstructed about its history using the CBGM. Large sections of the New Testament text do not have any extant attestation in the oldest witnesses. Fragmentary witnesses may also provide unique epistemological problems for the method. Take the following example. In this case, we have two texts, one from an intact witness and one from a fragmentary witness. If we only examine the sections which we have access to, uh, you'll notice that they have a somewhat high pre-genealogical coherence and the priority will be from A to B. But now let's look at what these numbers become when we're looking at the full text of B we see not only does their pre-genealogical coherence become somewhat low, but that the priority has shifted. B is now upstream from A. This scenario of a fragmentary witness would potentially be completely undetectable to the tools of the CBGM. And so with that, we've reached the end of the video. I'd like to thank you for watching, and uh, I'd like to note that this video has been for uh, the glory of Jesus Christ. And I'd just like to say that it's one thing to study the history about how the New Testament came to us, but it's another thing to know its central figure as your Lord and Savior. 
The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's my uh, call to everyone watching this video here, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. I'd also like to note that this video has been in memory of our late brother, Robert Paul Wyland, and I commend uh, all of his videos to you here on YouTube. Uh, the the uh, link to his channel will be in the description of this video. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Taylor DeSoto uh, of Agros Reformed Baptist Church in Gilbert, Arizona. Uh, he has been very helpful in uh, making this video, uh, in critiquing some of uh, uh, the content that I've sent him, uh, refining uh, the way that I've uh, stated some things in this video, and uh, I thank him uh, very much for the, uh, for the contribution that he made to this. Finally, again, for further study on the CBGM, uh, Tommy Wasserman and Peter Gurry have a fine book out explaining the method, and hopefully in conjunction with this introduction video, uh, you, can, uh, you can come to grasp the, the method fairly, uh, fairly solidly. Uh, and so with that, uh, I just again thank you for watching the video, and the Lord bless you and keep you on your way.